Hello. Today we're gonna be looking at book five of books. Ergin Tucker Starry Speculative Corpse Horror of Philosophy Volume 2. Chapter 1 Starry Speculative Corpse Descartes Demon. Sometimes around 6039 Rene Descartes sat down at his desk to write. At issue for him was a simple question concerning knowledge, philosophy, theology, mathematics, astronomy, medicine, the arts, and the nature of science of all claim to know things. From them, a cumulative understanding of the um, self, of others, of the world, and of the cosmos is made possible. But how do we know that we know is actually true? Mm, what is the foundation on which this, this party's fields of knowledge are based? Are there questions that cannot or should not be asked, le lest they undermine the knowledge they are designed to produce? How much uncertainty is tolerated before knowledge becomes doubt? When those doubts stop, if ever, an abyss opens up. For Descartes, this was a personal as well as a philosophical problem. As he writes, some years ago I noticed how many false things I had accepted as true in my childhood, and how doubtful were the things that I subconsciously brooded on them, and therefore uh, that once in a lifetime everything should be completely overturned, and I should be again from the most basic foundations. Being the astute thinker that he was, Descartes set out a method for addressing the problem. The task was, as he notes, ambitious and Descartes writes that he had been age at which to undertake this project. Whether the age of 43 was the right age or not is hard to say. He felt he had been waiting long enough, even too long, and so Descartes writes, Today I appropriately cleared my mind of all cares and arranged for myself sometimes free from interruption. I am alone, and at long last I will devote myself seriously and freely to this general overturning of my beliefs. The result of these exercises is skepticism are well known to study of philosophy, and when the Meditation on First Philosophy were published in Paris in 1641, they immediately attracted a whole range of res responses not least of our wrong from the ongoing debates over the relation philosophy, reason and fate. Descartes' most lasting application of his methodology doubt comes in the first of his meditations, where he considers how our sense devises us. Dreams, hallucinations, paintings, painting and other examples are discussed or instance in which we think we other examples are discussed as instance. In which we think fuck. <laughs> we know something based on sensory evidence and are in fact devices, but at least in this instance we can learn from experience to discussion, dream from reality and the image from the thing itself. Our senses are reliable if used properly, but Descartes pushes his doubt even further. What if our senses are by definition the captive? What if Deception is, as it were, hardwired into being. And Descartes rises the discretion throughout a kind of full experiment. Therefore, I will suppose that not God, who is the source of truth, but some evil mind, who is all powerful and cunning, has devoted all their energies to deceiving me. I will imagine that the sky, air, earth, colors, shapes, sounds, and everything external to me are, are nothing more than the creatures of dream my, by means of which an evil spirit attracts my credulity. I shall imagine myself as if I had no hands, no eyes, no flesh, no blood, no sense, as if my beliefs in all these things were false. Another abyss opens, often dubbed the evil demon or evil genius. Here we see Descartes pushing his talk to an extreme point, a point at which we no knowledge is possible because nothing is for certain. One thought is a good or as a bad as another, everything relative, arbitrary, haphazard, pointless, subject to continual deception.
prey to the cunning of no unknown entities, disembarrassed and insubtainable. Descartes has led himself to stand of the precipice of philosophy and per over the age, and what he finds there is a terrifying snare centred on not nor knowledge, nor even a single thought, just a tenebrous, impassive silence. But this is a tiring project, and a kind of laziness brings me back to what is more habitual in my life. Can we blame this Descartes for stepping back from the principle? Thinking is hard work, yes, but the negation of our thought is perhaps harder. What describes in Tavit till discovers it at once the ground and the greatest treat to philosophy the question that cannot be asked without undermining the idea of philosophy itself traditionally the socratic tradition in philosophy has a triptic function which is to dispel the horrors of the unknown not be tolerated in this tradition is the possibility of a world that cannot be known or a word that is indifferent to our elaborate knowledge producing scenes. Descartes' meditations begin and end in this mode. But along the way there are gasps, fishes, and lacuna in the philosophical edifice. With it, the evil demon Descartes stumbles upon a horror instinct to philosophy the thought that philosophy cannot think without undermining and annulling itself. In order to continue its work, philosophy must ignore it or gloss it over or skip it altogether. And so in the following meditation a foundation is providence by Descartes in his famous formulation Cogito Ergo Sum. Let him devise as much as he wishes. He will never bring it about I am nothing as long as I think I am something thus having weight up every quality would be state that this pros proposition i am i exist is necessarily true whenever it is started by me or conceived in my mind from this flaws an entire legacy of philosophical thinking in terms of Christian space Christian dualism and the privileging of human consci consciousness over all other forms of being. But it's not so easy to shake this card as demon which continues to hunt his philosophical twist to the end. It is always there treating to undermine whatever conceptual events this card has constructed. Better to not deal with it all at all and continue in philosophy. Descartes even confess, I am like a prisoner who happens and to enjoy an imaginary freedom in his dreams and who subsequently begins to suspect that he is asleep and afraid of being awakened, conspired silently with his horrible illusions. Count Depression On the 12th of February, 184, Immanuel Kant lie under his deathbed. His eye was ridged and his face and lips became discolored by a cadaverous pallor. A few days following his death, his head was shaved and a plaster cast was taken. Not a mask merely, but a cast of the whole designed to the cra craniological collection of Dr. Hagal, a local physician. The corpse of Kant was made up and dressed appropriately, and according to some accounts, throngs of visitors came day and night. Everybody was anxious to avail himself of the last opportunity he would have for entering himself to say, I to him Kant. Their impressions seemed to be at once reverent and grotesque. Great was the un Atonement of all people and the emergence of Kant appearance, and it was universally agreed that a corpse so wasted in flashes has never been beheld. Accompaniment by the church bells of Konigsberg, Kant corpse was carried from his home by torch light to a candle lit cathedral, whose gothic arches and spires were perhaps reminiscent of two of the philosophy elaborate valued books 
his book, A Short History of Decay, E. M. Kjorgen once wrote, I turned away from philosophy when it became impossible to discover in Kant any human weakness, any authentic axiom of melancholy. In Kant and made all the philosophers. Indeed, for many, the names of Immanuel Kant has become synonymous with a certain type of elaborate grand system bold in philosophy that characterizes work such a such as the Critique of Pure Reason, first published in 71. Indeed, so deserved was the impact of Kant's later critical philosophy, the textbook on the history of philosophy, often referred to philosophy before Kant and post-Kantian philosophy. The significance, significance of Kant philosophy is, however, counterbalanced by its not, 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 a notorious difficulty reading throughout the table of contents alone, which is dazzling and elaborate in an array of sections, subsections, and subsections, and is a task in and of itself. Nevertheless, if Kant's philosophy achieved one thing, it was a renewed optimism in philosophy, much in line with enlightenment ideas concerning the advantage advantages of secular reason and the maturing of humanity as a whole. Reading throughout Kant's work with their patient and rigorous devising and subdivisions, there is a sense of philosophy as an all-encompassing, totalizing endeavor. Philosophy, it, in its Kantian modes, knows everything. It even knows what it doesn't know. That Kant suffered from depression may come as a surprise, especially given the ambitions of his philosophical books and the enthusiasm of his wide riding intellectual interest. His lecture courses cover everything from philosophical logic to anthropology to chemistry through the end of the world. But in 1798, in a letter on the topic, part of prolonging human life, Kant comments on his own struggle with depression. The comments are rare for Kant, both in the sense of being personal and in the way they serve as a confession of weakness. In typical fashion, Kant first defines depression as the weakness of abandoning oneself, the to general morbid feelings that have no definite object, and so making no attempt to master them by reading Kant's field, to unfickle for their speculative debates in Kant's time of universe or the existence of a soul. Reasons become employed for no reason, or at least for no good reason. An issue for Kant is not just to employ just the employment of reason over fate or imagination, but the instrumental use of reason, reason mastering itself, including its own limitations. This was as much the case for everyday throughout as it was for philosophical thinking. The opposite side of the mind self master is fatal at broadening about the ills that could be veil befall one and that one would not be able to withstand if they should come. And when the coherence of reason is threatened, so is philosophy, or rather so is the philosopher. A little later on, Kant order the strange confession. I myself have a nature disposition to hypochondria because my flesh chest, which leaves little room for the movements of the heart and lungs. And, it's, and in my early years, this, this, pro, this position made me almost weary of life. As were Kant wrote sense of this depression. In the Critique of Judgment, for instance, he, allow, he allows that misanthropy is uh, preferable and even has the character of the zombie. Falsehood integrates injustice, the purity of the ends which we ourselves look upon as great and momentous. This also counts contracting the idea of what men might be if they only would and are so at variance with our active wish to see them better that to avoid hating what one cannot love it seems but a slight sacrifice to forget all the joys of fellowship with our kind. But Kant does not give in so easily to this pathology of thought. Philosophy is a Panace. 
can dis distinguish philosophy from philosophy throughout both play a therapeutic role in my self mastery. Philosophy for Kant does not involve being a philosopher but instead is a means of awarding of many dis desirable feelings and besides a stimulant to the mind that introduces an interest into the, its occupation. At another level there is a philosophy proper whose interest in entire final end of the reason and absolute unity and which brings with it feeling of power which can well compensate to some degrees for physical weakness of old age very ration estimation of life's value this is all fine from the critical distance of philosophical self-mastery but things get a little more complicated and this course is the same is essay he also discussed for then died and sleep what Kant does consider is that reason might actually be concerned but to depression, rather than stand as its opposite. What if depression reasons failed to achieve self-mastery is not the failure of reason but instead the result of reason? What if human walks too well and brings us to a conclusion there are at man to the excesses of human beings? What we would have is a cold rationalism shorting up the anthropocentric conscience of the philosophical invaders, showing us an anonymous, faceless world impervious to our hopes and desires. And in spite of Kant's lifelong dedication to philosophy and the engagement project in several of his writings, he allows himself to give voice to this cold rationalism. In his essay on libidinism optimist, he questions the knowing God that is at one's benefits towards humanity but allows human beings to destroy each other and in his essay they all are things that Kant not only questions humanity domination over the world but he also questions over presumption to know that and if the world will end at a all, but why do humans being accept an end to the world at all? And if this is con con conceived to them, why must it be a terrible end? The implication in this and other comments by Kant is that the reason and the rational stimulation of life value may not have our own best interest in mind in itself. The self mastery of reason may not coincide with the self mastery of us as human beings, or in need of the special as a whole. Was the reason taken to this to this length? Lengths will not only make a philosophical uh, philosophy improbable. For how could one have philosophy without philosophers? but also impacting and what would be the use of such a depressive reason what can refers to as depression is simply the stark realization that throughout is only incident it would take a later generation of philosophers to derive the conclusion of this that throughout thinking as not the reverse legend has it that Kant's final word on his deathbed was enough uh, the uh, aged participated philosopher of Kons Konigsberg let out a word that was also a sight and depressive reason seems to have, have had their final say. Nietzsche's, Nietzsche's laughter. Nothing is more indivisive of human culture that the obsessiveness with which it has deceived its own planet. When the Earth was decanted from the universe by Copernican astronomy, this was more that compensated for by the innumerable images of the Earth produced over the years by artists and scientists alike. The Earth was and is, in many ways, still at the center of things. In this sense, the first televised images of the Earth can no doubt be regarded 
as the principle of a species science is one that has on its other side in the many computerizing films imagine of a disaster one zombie ride an apocalyptic landscape we are so fixated on the earth that is on ourselves that we would rather have a ruined earth than no earth at all astronauts often refer to the phrase view of earth as the overview effect suggesting that the view of the earth from space produces a shift in con consciousness that we as human beings are not separate from the planet on which we live the general message is the of something wandering wonder and unity national boundaries disappear and over its surface the planet reveals strange luminous patterns of colors cold cloud and light otherwise known as cities smog and the electric grid Thanks to digital, digital technology, the overview effect can now be an everyday experience. However, in its appeal for a planetary consciousness, the overview effect tends to reveal something different. The indifference of the planet vis-a-vis -vis all repeated attempts to render its magic in full. It is the context that one is reminded of Nietzsche's of quote passage from on truth and lie in an extra moral sense. In some remote corner of the universe, poured out and glittering is an innumerable solar system. There once was a star on which clever animals intended knowledge. That was the hauntiest and most malicious minute me of world history, yet only a minute after nature had drawn a few breaths, the star grew cold, grew cold, and the clever animals had to die. He knew us a different take on the overview effect. In this version, we have never been one with the planet, nor does the planet require our cleverness and technical ingenuity to save it from ourselves. It is tempting to imagine Nietzsche himself as a present day astronaut going up into space, turning back and seeing the Earth and noticing, noticing the contrast between the indifference glittering planet and the equal indifference of the vast animals on its surface. No doubt Nietzsche ill health would mean that he would fail to complete the astronaut training and so he would settle for writing it down. But Nietzsche's capacity for undermining the humans is perhaps needed no more than ever. On the one hand, we who are still on the Earth's surface cannot escape an awareness of the impact of climate change based as we are by disasters that increasingly refuse the this fun, this distinction between the natural and human made. On the other hand, the proceed of resuperating the planet for us as human beings continue to inhabit. Whenever we and save the planet is one question. Whenever the planet needs saving is another. Nietzsche and Capitalist did this dilemma in the title of his third published book, Human All to Human, a book that captures the polyphony of vo voices in Nietzsche writing. Uh, by tone, sarcastic, enthusiastic, naive, full, meditative, joyful. For example, in the second volume of Human All to Human, Nietzsche gives us yet another much more sardonic variant of the overview effect. There would have to be creatures of more spirit than human beings, simply in order to savor the human that lies in humans, seeing themselves as the purpose of the whole existing world and humanity beings seriously satisfied only with the prospect of our world missions. If a god did create the world, he created humans as gods, apes, and as a kind continual case for us amusement in his all too lengthy eternity. Our uniqueness is the word. Alas, it is too uh, improbable a uh, thing. The astronomers, astronomers who sometimes really are granted a field of vision de detached from the earth in intimate that the drop of life in the world is without significance for the total character of the immense ocean of becoming and passing away. The hand in the forest, perhaps, imagined as 
as uh, strongly that is the goal and purpose for the existence of the forest when in our imagination tied and downfall of humanity almost involuntarily to the downfall of the earth. As Nietzsche achieves the strange and the way of human thinking dance tends to eclipse the world until we c become so philosophical solipsis that even the non-human bites to look a lot like the human. Nietzsche caps off his rant with the following. Even the most dispassionate astronomer can himself scarcely fill the earth without life in any other way that has the gleaming and floating gravity of humanity. But Nietzsche phrases mentally ultimately has several meanings. Certainly it evokes a sense of disappointment, the all too human as less than, than human, as the failure to live up to the various standards, critica, criteria and value that we associate with being human. And as Nietzsche repeatedly points out in his book, this itself had become a hallmark of the human. But the phrase also evokes a more critical sense of failing to challenge our most basic and habitual ways of thinking and living, including the questions of those same criteria and values that demarcate the, the human from the non-human. At the same time, Nietzsche's in, in servitude against humanity are outstripped only by his refusal to dispense with the term human much less imagine a romantic transcendental realm beyond the human itself, the height of humanist thinking. Nietzsche repeatedly affirms this notion of the human are too human, even as he lies against it. Human beings are all humans are not only because we fail to live up to the human and what we assume it means to be human but because we are merely human on the human and in a way that refuse both the divine flat of science as well as the natural history of religions chosen peoples. This is Nietzsche's own tragic comic brand of humanism, that there is nothing special about the human. When Nietzsche began writing Human All to Human around 1876, many changes were afoot. The 32 years old philosophic Gist was forced to retry from his teaching post at the University of Basel due to a series of health issues, which include stomach problems, arthritis, myrogenes, nauseous, vomiting, and rapidly deteriorating eyesight. He had also alienated himself from Wagner in his cultist circle opting instead for the life of uh, indifferent solars. Uh, in deciding to recollate uh, to a better climate, he traveled to Sorrento, Sorrento, where he wrote the bulk of the first volume of Human All to Human, 1878, with uh, the publication of Human All to Human, a book for free spirits, comprising some 600 uh, apophysism of the thousand copies printed only 120 sold. The remaining volumes were subsequently rebound, rebound together the second volume of the 1886 edition. The following years, another 400 apparatus would be published with the title Assorted Options and Maxims, and the year after the another 350 apparatus with the title The Wanderer and His Shadow, writing in Kehomo, some 12 years after its initial publication, Nietzsche would characterize the books as the monument of a crisis and a, of the crisis and a social cure. The change in lifestyle was echoed in Nietzsche's writing style as well, while in Sorrento Nietzsche began writing in the brief, a frosty style that would characterize some of his best known works. But Nietzsche aphorisms are not of a single mode and his turn to the short form manifests itself in different ways, from many essays in the vein of montage to tar maximum reminiscence of La roche uh, We also get dialogues, parables, poetry, even jokes. Human out to human not only reflects Nietzsche's experiment with style, but with reading as well. 
one anecdote has which are reading la refora cruciled a sentence at maximus on the train to surrender back to Flores Clues. In addition to Solari works on Greek tragedy and philology, Nietzsche is reading Chamfrot, Lice, Berg, Montaigne, Jean Pascal, Bavon, Targus, Voltaire, the dedicated of the first edition of Human Eye to Human. And of course, Schopenhauer, ever, ever Nietzsche's educator and paragon of misanthropic Catholicism. Human Eye to Human is a master class in fragmentary writing and excesses of the virtues of the incomplete part. As president, president today in our era of the overview effect, as it was in Nietzsche's era of Darwinism, the industrial revolution and the spiritualism, it is no accident that such experiment in the incomplete throughout take as their subject the problem of the human above all the phrases phrase human out to human signals the beginning of a trajectory that will reach across all of Nietzsche's writing and would continue into the rediscovery of his work by generations of 20th century philosophers and theorists. The overview effect render an as the gleaming and floating gravest of humanity, where Nietzsche writing today has might very well regard the flora and fauna of contemporary philosophy, posthuman, transhuman, inhuman, non-human, and so on, as so many variants of the impulse to redeem the human throughout the back door, the side door, a trap door. But Nietzsche himself was not immune to such impulse. For every misanthropic statement, there is a statement of almost as a Classic, almost embracing affirmation, and for mm. well, okay. For and for every impulse to start a project, there is the equal impulse to abandon it. An entry from Nietzsche's notebook in the fall of 1878 simply reads a novel, a volume of poetry, a history, a philology. An entry from the summer 1879, perhaps during a bout of illness, reads All I lack is a homo Another note 1879 reads I am thinking of having a long sleep. In his notebook, Nietzsche puts the phrases itself in quotes but does not give a references. Horror of philosophy. When his demon, he discovered a thread that potentially undermines his entire philosophical project, a dilemma presents itself. It discards arts, accept the demon as actual, he has remained true to his mention of skeptical doubt. But then his project is fertile, since there is no ground for his charts, and nothing can be known for certain. If the Descartes reject the demon either by ignoring it or by glossing it over, he can carry on with his philosophy, but he has effectively abandoned the original impetus behind his philosophy to begin with, and so philosophy becomes a kind of pantomime, the passing of time wasted energy. Either way, it seems that philosophy has to come of his fortitude and the equal possibility that one will never know for sure whether philosophy has better fruitly or not. This is the crux of the horror philosophy, which we see it discarded as demon, Kant, depression, and Nietzsche wrestling with an indifferent cosmos. Put simply, it is the thought that undermines itself in thought thought that sombers over itself and the age of an abyss, that moments when the philosopher stumbles upon Descartes or cannot avoid like Kant or actively confronts like Nietzsche, the very thing that undermines their activity as philosophers. Being philosophers, they cannot simply switch tracks and opt for, for poetry or mathematics, so they continue the lab of, of philosophy all the while under the tenable impersonal gaze of the horror of philosophy. Far from Zophy, I would argue that he didn't make philosophy interest, particularly if one misreads philosophy in this way, to adopt a method it might be this, read works of philosophy as if they were works of horror, of course, 
this is not at all ignore the difference between, say, the narrative fiction of Poe or Lovecraft and the analytic destructive language of Plato or Kant, but at the same time we know that many philosophers make use of literary elements, Plato's dialogues being a prime example, not to mention Augustine use arts use of the parable. And we know that many of the classics of the horror genre from poetry to Lovecraft to the new weird in fiction are largely in the idea driven stories and make extensive use of the discursive modes in the narration or dialogue. Our images discard as the accidental necromancer making castial pacts with demons. One imagines cats swinging before the looming abyss of a chaotic maelstrom. One imagines Nietzsche revealing in the fiendesilic extinction of the species and um, the attendant exhaustion of vampiric thought. The pros proposition that governs this book, Star Speculative Corps, is that something interesting happens when one takes philosophy not as a heroic feat of explaining everything, but as a the confrontation with the thought that the undermines thought, the philosophy, philosophy of fertility. Certainly, there is a bit of tongue in cheek in this method of reading philosophy, as it were horror and like the other methods, it is not to be taken too seriously, but the focus in the section that follow he will be on those moments when philosophy reveals the thought that undermines it is a uh, philosophy when the philosopher confronts this thought that cannot be thought. Admittedly, the title of the series of book horror be dot. In one sense, it is something of joke of a joke. Anyone who say has a student has has as a student been forced to read a philosopher like Kant or Wars, Hegel, has no doubt felt of central horror philosophy. The sheer heft of a book, like the Critique of Pure Reason, is indemiting in and of itself, never mind the pages upon pages of jargon file divisions and subdivisions that make of any notion of plain language or common sense. Much of philosophy today prides itself on instilling the intellectual horror in the reader. It is too serious to be taken lightly, too full of gravity to joke about, reply, replayed with relevance, rigor, authority. But this is not just limited to the obscure corners of academic philosophy. Our public intellectuals and pop philosophers also leverage the elimination factor in the goals of the know it all, the self helpful guru, the philosopher as uh, the person authorized to say something about everything, obliging us to stroke our collective birth in rashness, gestures of prompt fitty. As a reader, my reaction is something out of a B horror movie. I recoil in terror. But if the phrase horror of philosophy is a joke, it is because it simply reveals the phrase philosophy of horror, directly pointing to a basic assumption we have about philosophy itself. A philosophy of horror implies a relation between the relation between philosophy and its object. Specifically, the philosophy will later explain its object, whereas in itself it is a confusing give meaning to its object whereof whereas in itself it lacks meaning, or render its object clear, apparently and transparently, uh, whereas it itself is opaque and hidden. This applies to an, any formula of the type philosophy of X, where X is philosophy's object, an object that stands apart from philosophy, and because of this can be analyzed, unpacked, and dissect. Today we not only have the philosophy of religion, the philosophy of nature, the philosophy of mathematics and political, ethical and moral philosophy, but also the philosophy of cognition, the philosophy of technology, even the philosophy of philosophy, that is metaphilosophy. Questions arise. Is philosophy objects always separate from it? What happens when the critical distance of philosophy collapses? Does philosophy really have the ability to explain everything? Is philosophy specializing in its 
universality and if philosophy can explain everything, how would we know that this and what language would be appropriate to for expressing it? At what point does a philosophy of fluidity become indistinguishable from the fluidity of philosophy? The three volumes aim to take up these questions in different ways, using different this curious story of philosophy. The first volume, In the Dust of This Planet, introduced the general themes, particularly reading the limits of the human and the ideal, the world without walls. This volume, Stereo Speculative Corpse, aims to, as I've said, read, the, read philosophy as it were horror, while the third volume, Tentacles Longer Than Night, aims to dare do reverse to read works of the horror genre as if they were works of philosophy. Thank you for continuing this. Uh, if you want more chapters, just just uh, set a comment below. And you can also go into my website, links below, and Instagram, of, of, of course, links below. So thank you for watching. The end.